idea what else I was supposed to say, but I think I got it. We have some announcement videos coming up, and after that, kids, you'll be dismissed. So check those out. Good morning, Grace. I'm Pastor Luke, and here are three things you need to know today. The first thing you need to know is that Growth Track Step 1 is today. Growth Track is your next step to get connected at Grace. And today is a great day for you to start. It's step one. If you haven't come to Growth Track before, we want to welcome you to come today. We have child care. There'll be some food for you. And uh, it's just a great chance for us to connect, for you to get to know who we are, and for us to get to know you. I'll be there today. It's 12 o'clock in the Kids Connection uh, large classroom. Hope to see you there. The second thing you need to know is that there is a men's bowling night on March 30th from 7 to 9. It will be at Brunson at the Strike Zone. A great time for guys to get together, hang out, build some relationships, and encourage each other. Uh, so guys, mark that on your calendar. Plan to be there March 30th uh, going to Brunson Strike Zone. The third thing you need to know is that we have an incredible opportunity. We are hosting the Moendo Children's Choir here at Grace. They're coming to do a tour, concerts all over the place, but we are the host church for them as they come. They come from Treasured Kids School, which is one of our global focus partners. We've been partnered with them for many years. Being a host church for them means we have some unique opportunities that you can get involved. Uh, so visit the connections table. You'll find two ways that you can get involved with the children's choir. The first is that you can be a host home for them. If you have room in your house, you can host two to three children along with an adult chaperone. You could be a host home. It's a really cool way to get to know them and host them in your home while they're here. It won't be every day, but it will be lots of opportunity to host them. Another way you can get involved is you can pack a duffel bag for them as they come. In the duffel bag, we'll put several outfits for them while they're here, toiletries, and different necessities for their time here while they're in the States for approximately six months. If you're interested in either of those opportunities, please visit the connections table today. Well, those are your three things you need to know today. Thanks for coming, and we hope you have a wonderful day. All right, kids, you are dismissed. Jesus, bless the kids, bless the volunteers. Let them experience you in new ways today. Give them fresh life and remind them that you are alive and you came to bring them life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to greet the cafe service. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have two services going on at the same time in one church. Welcome. It's great to have you with us, cafe service. And welcome to everybody else. I know that we have some special guests this morning here for a very special baby dedication. We get to celebrate new life in the church and with some families as they say to the Lord, this child is ours and we trust, or is yours, and we trust you with them. Not going to take them back. We're going to give them to the Lord. So we're excited to do that this morning. This morning we have five families that will be dedicating a child to the Lord. And so I want to invite those families to come up now. We're going to just fill the front of this stage. Let's see, for cafe service, should they come up here? I think we'll be okay. So come on up, families and friends. I know that you brought lots of people to support you. Come on up. Anybody that wants to come stand with these families... We're going to spread out. Yep, Dan and Marie, you guys can come right here, actually. That will be great. Yep. Come on up. Come on over here, Marla and Johnny. Let's see, who else is, is coming? Brandon and Abigail, why don't you guys come right up here on the stage with your family? Oh, sweet. Come on up, Abigail. Isn't this fantastic? Look at all this support we have. So Ryan and Lupita are over here if you're with them. Dan and Marie are here. Come on up, guys, right up here. Johnny and Marla are here. Aaron and Alex are here. And Brandon and Abigail are here. Isn't this great? All right, well, I'm going to let... Um,
the mom or the dad introduce their little one because we have so many people we won't introduce all the people that are with you but we will welcome them and we're so happy to have the support so i'm going to have you um mom or dad either one introduce your little one and their birth date we will have a picture on the screen a slide of them as well that you can see so let's see ryan or lupita i'm going to give you the microphone as you introduce your little guy uh, we introduced to you, this is Jacob Ezekiel Seymour. He's taking a little nap this morning. <laughs> but we want to uh, dedicate him to the Lord and bring him before the church this morning to do that. Fantastic. Okay, Marie, would you like to introduce yours? Or Dan, either sure. one. Um, this is Faith Elizabeth Cherry. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. And this is Dan and Marie Cherry and her... Their sweet little faith. Okay, let's see. There's. I'll go to you guys next. There's so many of you. I love it. Who wants to do this? This is Addison Jo Yoder. She was born on January 12th. And, yeah. and this is Brandon and Abigail Yoder. Okay, I'll just go ahead and say this is Johnny and Marla Miller. Oh, thank you. I'll catch you. Did I miss one? Nope, I think that's all for Ryan and Lupita. Okay, I'll catch you guys. <laughs> this is Jalea Ariel, and she was born October 30th. Hello. She's wide awake, too. Okay, Aaron and Alex. This is uh, Anna Faith Miller, and she was born December 13th of last year. Is that your sister? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's just give them all a hand and celebrate. This is a very special morning for the parents, for the extended family, for the support systems, and for the little ones, absolutely. I want to invite the leadership team to just come and gather around each of these families, if you're able to. We have one over here, one here, two on the stage. <laughs> And one over here. And I want to invite Pastor Luke. He's, he's just going to share a little bit about baby dedication. I'm going to stand way out here. Can you guys see me? Wow, somebody make sure you get a picture of this. This is beautiful. All right. What a party. And I think everybody is first-time parents except for Aaron and Alex, right? First time. If you guys haven't figured it out already, parenting is a high calling and it's a piece of cake. So you guys will have no problems whatsoever. Um, actually, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of challenges, uh, but we believe that you guys have what it takes uh, to be great parents and to train your children in the ways of the Lord. That's what the scripture encourages us and exhorts us to do. And so we're here to help you guys. Uh, look at all your support. So before you leave today, say, I need your help, okay? Make sure all these people who came with you know that their job is to help you, to encourage you, support you, and to be a part of this journey with you. So I just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, we're not baptizing babies this morning. We're dedicating babies. Um, so we believe uh, baptism is for believers who have made a decision themselves to follow Christ. Uh, but what we do is follow the example of, uh, in scriptures of Hannah bringing Samuel uh, before the Lord and dedicating him to, in the temple to Eli there. And also Mary and Joseph, Jesus' uh, mom and dad, they brought Jesus to the temple and they dedicated him. And uh, what it really means, parents, is that you're dedicating yourselves. You're dedicating yourselves to the Lord. Um, you're, you're, it's a way of saying, God, thank you for this child that you've given me. I'm so excited uh, to be parents. We're taking it seriously. Uh, we want to celebrate them. But also, God, I trust you. I trust my child in your hands. Uh, I trust that you will fill in all the gaps that we as imperfect parents uh, have in our family, but we trust that you'll also help us as parents uh, to be uh, your parents for this child. And, and also, it's a commitment to impress the heart of God on your children. And that really is your number one calling as parents, to impress the heart of God on your children, to show them what it looks like to follow the Lord with your whole heart, to, to set them up so that they have the best possible environment, to, to have their own strong faith and commitment to follow the Lord, so that they can see and know and experience and feel the love of God in your home. 
So you guys get to model that, and uh, you get to show them what it looks like. And this morning is just a really cool uh, moment for you guys to remember that that's what this parenting thing is all about. That's what uh, we're doing, and that's why we need so much help, uh, because it, it really is a high calling. So let me just read your commitment as parents. Not only are you dedicating your child to God, you are dedicating yourself as parents to Christ and the church. You are committing yourselves to maintaining a Christian home where Christ is honored, the word of God is held in high regard. A child's first impression of God comes from you. Children sense our commitment to God and are far more perceptive than we sometimes realize. For that reason, uh, we exhort you to be diligent in your own commitment to experience know and become like Christ. So your kids will take their cue from you. So uh, the best thing you can do as parents is be passionate about your relationship with God and create an environment for them. Well, we're going to pray with them. Can we all just do that? We're just going to, uh, I'm going to make my way around the church here as we pray. Amanda and I will kind of go back and forth praying for different uh, families. I'll go ahead and let Amanda pray for the uh, first one there. All right. Thank you, Lord, for faith. Thank you that you have brought her for such a time as this. Father, thank you for the gift that you've put in her, the, even the gift of faith. Father, thank you that as Dan and Marie are just saying, we dedicate her to the Lord, that they're putting their trust in you. Father, thank you for the heart that they have to raise her in your ways. And Lord, I pray that you would give them strength as parents, that you would watch over them. Thank you for the life that you've put in faith, Lord, and the protection that you have over her. And I pray, God, that they would just feel you with them every step of the way. Lord, I, I just want to speak against the enemy's attack. And we pray, God, for life over this family, Lord. We thank you for your good plans. Thank you for the, the, the plan of faith that you have for little faith and the joy that she brings to this family, Lord. We bless the extended family. We thank you for aunts and uncles and grandma and grandpas. Father, we thank you for their heart to raise their grandchildren in the Lord. And I just pray that you would cover this whole family, God. Thank you for their good plans. And we just bless them all. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, we thank you for little Anna Miller. Lord, I pray that your hand would be on her life, that you would watch over her, protect her, be with her all of her days. Lord, I thank you for uh, her family, for her parents, Aaron and Alex, for her grandparents, cousins, uncles, aunts, uh, all the friends and support. Lord, we just pray that your grace uh, would fill their home and that Anna would just grow up uh, able to discern and hear your voice. God, I pray that you'd actually give her a really sharp ear to hear your voice. Give her a listening ear that she would know uh, the voice of God and that she would learn to discern your voice and even uh, to encourage others as she listens to you. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd bless her, watch over her, and be with her in Jesus' name. Yeah, and Lord, we pray for Addison oh God, Joe. Joe. God, we thank you for the life that you've given her. We thank you that, that her parents are saying, we trust you with her. God, I pray that you would just help her to continue to be a peace bringer. I just declare that over her little life, that she is a peace bringer. And in tough situations, as she walks in, that she'll bring peace. Father, in every area that she goes, in her, in her school, in her church, in her family, and in, in the store even, that she is a peace bringer. And we just declare that over her. God, thank you for your good plans for Addison. Thank you that you have plans to prosper her, that you've given her hope, God, and that she can just walk in a room and bring peace. Even just her presence will bring peace. God, thank you that you are with her. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would be with Brandon and Abigail as mom and dad. I pray that you would give them strength as they raise her in the Lord, God. Thank you that they are the perfect pan parents for her. And I just pray a covering over them as they raise her. And over the extended family as well, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, God, we just cover them, Lord. We thank you that little Addison will bring peace even into the extended family, God. Thank you for your good plans for Addison and this family, God. Thank you that their hearts are to raise her in the Lord. And we just cover them all in Jesus' name. Yes, Amen. Lord. Lord, thank you for Jalea, Jalea Miller. Lord, I pray that you would bless her, that you would fill her with life. Lord, we just thank you that you have good plans for her. Thank you for uh, the path that she's come, and Lord, that you have a path for her to go. And Lord, you know the beginning, and you know the end, and you know everything in between. And so, Lord, we trust 
her life in your hands. We, uh, Lord, we just thank you for wholeness in her life. We thank you for peace in her life. Lord, thank you that you brought her uh, to Johnny and Marla, that they are the perfect parents for her. Uh, Lord, I pray that your grace would be on them as they grow and learn and uh, uh, discover uh, what it looks like to be Jalea's parents. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would anoint them, anoint their home with peace and fill it with the presence of God. Lord, I thank you for such a strong uh, support system for them and their family and friends. And Lord, I just pray uh, that you would watch over them in all that they do, Lord. Bless them. Bless Jalea in Jesus' name. And Lord, thank you for Jacob. Thank you for what you've done in him, even since the beginning of his life. Thank mm -hmm. you for the miracle that he is yes, for this family. Thank you, God, for the answer to prayer that he is. And Lord, we bless him. We thank you that Ryan and Lupita are dedicating him to you, Father, that they're raising him in the Lord. And Lord, we know that you have good plans for Jacob. Father, thank you for the mouthpiece that you've given him. Thank you for the testimony that you'll be able to pour out through him of miracles and of provision. Thank you, God, for the ways that you have plans to use him. And we just bless him, God. I pray that you would strengthen him. I pray that you would give him new life. Father, I pray that his perspective would be different than others, that he would understand and have wisdom beyond his years, what you've called him to. We just declare wisdom over him in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you for Ryan and Lupita. I thank you for the miracles that they've experienced in their life. Father, I thank you for the new hope that you've given them. And Lord, we just continue to stand with them for hope, Father. We thank you for the faith that you've put in them. And we continue to believe in faith for the miracles that you have for both of them. Father, we thank you for their heart to raise Jacob in your ways. And I pray that you would bless them and honor them in that. And Father, I pray for the extended family and the support system that you've given Ryan and Lupita. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom and counsel, that they would be able to support Ryan and Lupita as they raise Jacob in the ways of the Lord. Father, I pray that you would just surround them through this extended family with wisdom and help and support. Lord, we bless this family. We thank you for them. We thank you for what you've done in them already and the plans that you have for them moving on. And we just bless Jacob in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. Let's just give everybody a very warm, loving applause. Thank you for trusting your kids with us. You guys can make your way back. What a cool thing. Well, if you're watching online or over in cafe service, we love family. We love to celebrate family. That was a little chaotic, but that's okay, right? It's Grace Christian Fellowship. We don't mind chaos every once in a while, as long as it's organized and done with respect. So <laughs> thank you, families, for your respectful chaos this morning. Oh, it's so good. Um, just want to remind you, today uh, we're in between series, but in two weeks we're going to start a new series called The Gospel According To, and that'll be a four-week series. We're looking forward to that leading up to Easter. Uh, we're going to take some time looking at four eyewitness accounts and uh, what they have to say about Jesus, how Jesus impacted their lives, and what they want us to know about Jesus. We're going to see how an encounter with Jesus changed everything. For many people, including uh, some people even from Grace, we're going to hear some testimonies about how the gospel has impacted our lives. And so we're looking forward to that. Uh, feel free to invite friends and family uh, to come be a part of that uh, series, The Gospel According to. Also just want to give a brief update on the Moendo Children's Choir uh, that will be coming uh, towards the end of May. And so they're from Treasured Kids School, which is one of our missions partners, global focus partners, uh, that we've been connected with for a lot of years. 
and we're excited to have them come. We're a host church for them. Part of bringing them here was raising the money to get them here. Just want to give an update. Uh, so far, we've had almost $40,000 uh, given towards that. The, the total number is $100,000. So we've made a lot of progress, but there's still room for people to participate and be a part of that. It's a loan, not a gift. So uh, the goal is we'll get them here, and then uh, as they uh, are here, they'll be able to uh, return that money. So we're looking forward to hosting them. And also, uh, they'll be booking venues for them. So if you know uh, friends, family, if you have connections in other places, uh, they'll be looking for places that would be interested in having the children's choir. And I just want to say, uh, it will be great entertainment. There'll be a lot of fun. Um, but it will also challenge you. It will bless you. They really have a ministry, and you will be touched and impacted uh, as they come. So we're really excited to have them here this summer. What a cool thing. Well, I'm going to read from the book of Psalms here uh, as we begin. Psalm 27. And if you want to follow on the screen, you can follow on the screen. If you want to just listen... You can do that as well. If you want to close your eyes and let the words sink into your soul, um, I just want to start with this psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that, I'm, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence." I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, God, I would pray that you would strengthen us where we're weak, that you would minister to us where we need a touch from you. Uh, God, I pray that you would just anoint this time right now, uh, that we would have an encounter with you. And Lord, I thank you that you are here, you are with us, and you care about us. And so, Lord, we just open our hearts to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Everybody's waiting for something, aren't we? We all love waiting, don't we? Waiting is our favorite thing to do. We're waiting for something, right? You're in a transition. You're waiting for that next step. Uh, maybe in your job, you're waiting for a promotion, a raise, a new position, a transfer. You're waiting for something. Maybe you're waiting for that special someone. Just waiting for them to come tro trancing down the road. Is that a word? Okay. Okay. Let's take that one off the video. You're waiting for what's next. Maybe you're waiting for the answer to a question you have. You've got a question, something in the back of your mind, and you're waiting. You're waiting for an answer. Uh, maybe you're waiting for an unfulfilled dream to come to pass, or desires that you have. You're waiting 
for the fulfillment of that. You're waiting for healing. You're waiting for a miracle. Maybe you're waiting for a financial breakthrough or for provision. We're waiting for something. Maybe you're waiting for reconciliation of a relationship or just you're waiting for a sense of purpose. What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? And how can I make a difference? And if that last question is yours, come to Growth Track. That's one of our goals is to help you answer that question. 12 o'clock today, we'll talk about that in the next couple weeks. But we're all waiting. Sometimes we're waiting for an airplane. Don't you hate that? You're waiting for an airplane and it's canceled. It's delayed. It's rerouted. About a month ago, we were traveling to Canada and I was so excited uh, because the city where we were going to is really hard to get to. You, you end up flying to like three different places and it takes all day and it's just like, ugh. Oh. And when I booked the tickets for this flight, I got the perfect booking. It was the most direct route you could take. It was the shortest amount of time, and it was a really good fare. I was super excited. I was like, finally, I booked it just right. I was so excited about it. And so we, we even went to Detroit the night before, got a hotel, so we wouldn't have to get up too early the next day to make our flight. And it was that week when it was really cold, like minus 15. Well, on Wednesday night, everything looked good. On Thursday morning when I woke up, I grabbed my phone just to check the status of the flight. Canceled. Everything canceled. Ah! So I got right on the phone, called customer service, got a hold of somebody in about 15 minutes, and she said, yeah, I'm really sorry. Uh, because of the weather, flights are still happening, but they can't de-ice the planes fast enough. So we have to cancel some of the flights. And well, congratulations, you won the lotto. <laughs> they canceled yours. So she was able to rebook us. Uh, it was delayed a couple hours, uh, but we were still going to make it. It wasn't the most direct route. We now had to go through another city. There was longer layovers, uh, all this kind of stuff. Well, at least we'll get there. And so we went uh, to the airport in time for a flight, and we made the first flight. We got to Toronto, and when we got off the plane in Toronto, we had a nice long layover. We thought, let's get some lunch, and on our way to lunch... I checked up the flight status, and guess what? Delayed. Oh, come on. Don't do this to me. And so we had lunch, and I thought, well, I'm going to call customer service while we're having lunch and just see what my options are, because I knew the delay was getting close, so I wouldn't make my next connection. So I called, and it was like, your wait time will be one hour and 50 minutes. It's like, what in the world? But the beautiful thing about technology Leave your phone number and we'll call you back when the next person's available. Okay, great. Left my phone number. We had a three-hour layover. I never got a call back. <laughs> Finally, it was getting time for a flight to leave, and I was doing the math. Okay, if this plane leaves exactly when it says it leaves, we'll have just enough time to get off the plane and run and make our connecting flight. Okay, this is great. We can still make it. Well, I wasn't feeling this is great but I thought at least we could still make it. But it was starting to hit me. Ah, perfect itinerary ruined. My day is ruined. Okay, so we got on the plane. There's 30 other people on the plane that are all trying to make the same connection. If we would just leave, when they said we would leave, we'll be okay. So we get on the plane, and what do we do? We sit there. This is the captain speaking. We're going to be delayed a few minutes while the maintenance crew does some routine checks. <laughs> I said to Amanda, of course, of course they have to do this right now. Of course we'll be delayed. A few minutes later, this is a captain speaking. We're going to be delayed another half hour because they have to go get a part and they don't have it with them. I was like, are you kidding me? Finally, he's like, this is the captain speaking, everything's fixed, the checklist is done, but we have to wait for a truck to come and de-ice us again because we've been sitting here too long. We'll be waiting another half hour. Yeah! I could feel the tension building inside of me, like I was going to explode, and so I decided it's best if I don't talk to anybody for the rest of the day. It's just safer for all of us if I don't talk to anybody. Finally, we got up, we took off. We landed in Calgary at midnight. No more flights that day. They gave us a coupon and said, hey, maybe you can get a discount at, the at a hotel or you can sleep on the airport floor. Good luck. 
see you tomorrow. I was so irritated. I was just like, don't even say anything to them. So I called the number for the discount, and I was like, how can you help us? And they're like, oh, we can get you $80 at this place. And I was like, click. <laughs> I didn't even say goodbye to the guy. I was so irritated. I just booked something on Priceline for 40 What is it about delays? I mean, it was like I had the perfect flight, and then it all got just thrown in the trash can. And I had to, like, I had to just wrestle it through with my soul. I was like, why did that affect me so much? I had all this expectation. I had anticipation. I had the satisfaction of the perfect booking, and then it just all got ruined. And it took me all night until the morning to wake up happy. Um, but eventually, I got over it. You know, seldom do we like delays. Waiting generally is not our strong suit, uh, but it's a theme, and it's common. All through Scripture, we see people who waited We have Joseph, who waited 13 years when he had his dream that he would one day become a great ruler and even his family would bow down to him. But immediately after that, he was betrayed, he was sold into slavery, he spent some time in prison, he was forgotten in prison. 13 years, Joseph waited for the fulfillment of that dream. And while he waited, God was at work. Abraham waited 25 years. God said, look at the stars. As many stars as you see, that's how many descendants I'll give you. Look at the sand on the seashore. As much sand as there is, that's how many your descendants will be. Too numerous to count. And Abraham's like, God, I'm 75 and I don't have a kid. And he waited 25 years until he was 100 years old before Isaac was born. And the fulfillment of promise began to take place. Moses waited 40 years. He thought he would rescue his people and help them. Instead, he fled for his life and spent 40 years watching sheep in the wilderness. And then one day, God appeared to him in a burning bush and said, Now's the time. Go and bring my people out of Egypt into a land that I will show you, a promised land. It's good. It's flowing with milk and honey. And then even then, Moses was delayed another 40 years because of Israel's unbelief and unwillingness to enter the promised land. In fact, Moses never stepped foot into it. The best he could do is climb Mount Nebo and see it afar. There it is. And then he died, never walking into that promise that God had given him. Jesus himself waited 30 years until he began his ministry. And then in three years, he turned the world upside down. Waiting. If you're waiting for something, then you're in good company. We're all waiting for something. I'm not good at waiting. I'm impatient. Sometimes I'm bored. Uh, Sometimes it's maybe adult attention deficit disorder. Maybe it's just that I'm American. I'm not sure. Uh, But I struggle with waiting. Even as a kid, I grew up on a farm, and I thought I should go hunting. All my friends are hunting. I should go hunting. So I would... I'd get up on opening day of deer season, and I'd get the gun, and I'd go out, and I'd sit in the woods, and I'd be there for 10 minutes, and I'd be like, nothing's coming. This is stupid. I should go. (laughs) Why am I sitting out here? I'm tired. It's dark. I'm cold. This is pointless. I just didn't have the patience for hunting. Same thing with fishing. I only like to fish when they're biting nonstop. (laughs) I don't care how big they are as long as there's some action happening. Then I'm okay. If nothing's biting, it's like... There's something else to do, I'm sure. I have a hard time waiting. Modern conveniences have taught us that everything is instantly available, right? How often are you sitting, you're having a conversation with somebody, and they have a question, they're like, I wonder about this, and every, what's the first reaction? Well, let's check our phone, Google, right? Hey, Siri, what about this? Hey, Alexa, help me out with this. Everything's at our fingertips, Instant download, prime, available, right? When's the last time you sat and you waited without a screen? Like really waited for an extended period of time. We don't do it very well anymore. You know, even microwaves and Instapot and fast food, waiting, waiting, waiting. I was... Uh, intrigued by this idea of the Hawaiian luau pig. How many people have ever had the Hawaiian luau pig? It is the opposite of fast food. 
Like, it is one of the longest meals it'll take uh, to prepare. These guys start days in advance preparing the pig. To cook the pig, they dig a big hole, a big hole, and they fill it with these river rocks. And then they get a really big fire going in the hole. And they, they have that fire burn for several hours until the rocks are just super, super hot, glowing hot. And then they have this pig wrapped in banana leaves, and they put the pig in the hole, and then they cover the pig uh, with banana leaves and other stuff, and then a tarp, and then they cover it with dirt, and they leave the pig in the ground for 16 hours while it slowly cooks in the earth. I'm like, give me a hot pocket. (laughs) Ain't no food that good, is there? We're all waiting for something. And often in our waiting, it feels like the beginning of creation, when the earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Do you ever feel like that sometimes in your waiting? It just feels formless, it feels void. What's going on? I don't know why I'm waiting. Sometimes it feels dark, it feels alone, it feels uncertain. But there's an awesome promise that comes with our waiting. The Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. See, in our waiting, we're not waiting alone. Even as creation had to wait, and it was void and formless, and it was dark, even in that waiting, the Spirit of God was there, hovering, preparing, moving over the surface of the water. And at just the right moment, light burst forth. That's how it is with us, too. It might feel lonely, void, formless, ambiguous, whatever, frustrating, but God is there. God is with us in our waiting, and God is working in our waiting. And at just the right moment, light bursts forth. We can trust that God is near even in our waiting. See, waiting is not God's absence. It's his avenue. And in fact, in our waiting, that's often when God works best. When we wait. When we wait upon the Lord, he renews our strength. He makes us strong. He does deep stuff in our heart. God's at work. So waiting isn't, doesn't mean that God is absent. It actually probably means God is working especially if we can tune into him and we can be a part of the process and invite God. Okay, God, I don't know why I'm waiting. I don't understand, but work in me. Here am I. Do your will, God. He works in our hearts. He works in our situations. He works in our circumstances. He's working in the world around us. See, we live in this linear world and we want to go from A to B to C to D and we see things almost like all lined up, but God steps outside of that. And God sees the beginning, and God sees the end, and God knows what it's going to take to get us from the beginning to the end. A lot of times we think we're ready here to step into here, but God says, no, I need to do some work, and I'm going to work in the waiting. And we can know that while God has worked, we can have this confidence that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. We can have a confidence in our waiting that he's working and that he hasn't given up, he hasn't stopped, but he'll carry it unto completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So what's happening in the waiting? I just want to take a few minutes here. We're going to look at David. David did a lot of waiting as well. I didn't mention him earlier. Uh, But David was the second king of Israel. He was Israel's greatest king. He's considered Israel's greatest king, one of the greatest kings to ever be, uh, lead on the face of the earth. David uh, was king approximately 440 years after Israel came out of Egypt, about 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. David was the king of Israel, the second king of Israel. Well, David experienced times of waiting. He didn't become king until he was 30 years old. But as a teenager, he was out in the field tending the sheep. And while he was out watching the sheep, the prophet Samuel came to his house, his father's house. And Samuel came with his flask of oil to anoint one of Jesse's sons 
to be the next king of Israel. And so he had the oldest son of Jesse pass through, and Samuel thought, boy, that guy looks like he could be the one. And God said, no, he's not the one. Don't look at his outward appearance. I'm looking at the heart. I'm looking at the heart. And so seven of David's older brothers passed before Samuel. No, no, no. And Samuel said, is this it? Do you have any more kids? And they said, well, there's one more. He's out tending sheep in the field. And Samuel said, well, call him in. And as soon as David came in, it says that Sam, Samuel knew that God spoke to him and said, he's the one. Rise up and anoint him. And Samuel anointed him with oil. It was this big, dramatic moment in front of all of his brothers, in front of his father. David's got oil dripping down his head. And then it just kind of leaves us hanging, like, what happened after that? It was like, and Samuel's like, okay, see you guys. And he left. And here David's like, now what? What do I do now? I think David probably went back out and tended the sheep, just like he was doing the day before. He went back to what he was doing, and David waited. But he didn't just tend sheep. David was in a season of preparation. And sometimes in our waiting, that's a season of preparation where God is preparing us for what he's called us to do. God's uh, working in us. He's uh, bringing stuff to come out into our lives. We're being developed. We're growing. There's preparation that happens in the waiting. What's happening in your life today could be preparation for tomorrow. Some of us need to take that seriously and need to say, okay, God, here am I. Prepare me for tomorrow. I'm waiting, but while I wait, I want to prepare. God, I invite you to work in me and prepare me for tomorrow so that I'm ready, so that I don't miss that day, so that I don't miss my moment. See, if David wouldn't have prepared himself in the waiting... He could have missed his moment, but David prepared himself. He was ready, and he wasn't just tending sheep. See, Saul, who was the king at the time, had some issues. He was tormented by an evil spirit, and some of his attendants said, I think what will help is if when the spirit torments you, if we find somebody who's really good at the harp, if we have them come and play for you, then you'll feel better. And Saul said, okay, that sounds good. Who do you recommend? You know who they recommended? One of the servants said, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre, which is a harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. How did David earn that reputation? He was a shepherd. Was he? David was being prepared in his time of watching the sheep, when, when the sheep would lie down to rest at night, I can just picture David getting out the harp and sitting around the fire or sitting under the stars and practicing, playing the music. You don't become awesome at a harp without practice. And I think he practiced and he wrote songs and he sang to God while he was out under the open skies. And he was being prepared. And so they called for David and David came and he uh, played the harp for Saul. He was being prepared. He took advantage of his waiting time, but he didn't just learn the harp. He practiced other things as well. See, when Goliath came, the champion from the Philistine army, and he began to challenge the armies of Israel and say, I defy all of you and the God you serve. Send out somebody to fight me. And this giant would come out day after day, 40 days the, the giant Goliath came out and he taunted the armies of Israel. And he was a huge guy, like over seven feet tall, big, massive. He was a behemoth. If you can describe a man that way, he was. He was huge. And nobody had the guts to face Goliath until David showed up one day the, at the army lines to check on his brothers. And while he was bringing supplies to his brothers and checking out what was going on with the army, he saw Goliath, and he heard the challenge, and he said, who's going to do something about this? This can't continue. And so they took David to King Saul, and they said, this guy wants to take on Goliath. And Saul's like, you can't do that. He's huge. You're just a boy. And we'll just pick it up here on the screen. Saul says, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. 
And when a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. What's David been doing while he's watching sheep? He's been preparing. He's learning how to use a slingshot. He can fling a stone 100 yards and hit a target. He's become an expert slinger. He's become brave, courageous, not afraid of death, not afraid to defend and put his life on the line. David has grown, and he's become a courageous young man. And the story goes that David took on the giant, and David defeated him. Why? Because he took advantage of his season of preparation. What is God preparing you for? In, in your season of waiting, what preparation might the Holy Spirit be doing in your life? God will use anything. He'll use any situation, any season, anything you put your hand to. God can use it if we allow him to, if we invite him to prepare us for where he's calling us to and what he has for us. God is preparing you. You know, part of preparation, our response to a time of preparation, I think, is to remember God's promises. Remember God's promises. And if you're not sure of what God's promises are, you can find a lot of them in this thing that we call the Bible. It's full of the promises of God that he speaks to us. Some are for specific people. Some are for all of us. And we find God's promises. And, or maybe uh, you're spending time in prayer and you hear God speak to your heart and whisper a promise to you. Write it down. Share it with somebody. Have them test it and see, does that sound like God? But remembering God's promises is huge in our time of preparation. David was a great psalmist, and he wrote down lots of psalms, and they attribute, they're attributed to him. And one of the psalms he wrote was 144. And he says, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield and whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. So I believe David caught a glimpse of the promises of God for him, and he began to do something about it. He became skilled, he became brave, he became courageous, and he learned to trust God. Part of our preparation is remembering the promises that God has for us. Before we move on, I just want to take a moment and pray into this area and respond to this. As you think about your life, and maybe you're in a season of waiting for something, and there's a preparation God wants to do in you, I just want to pray for you. Lord, we thank you that you work in the waiting. You work in those gaps in our life, in those quiet places, those in-betweens, You work in our confusion. You work in our frustration. God, you work. You're working all the time in us, and it's a good work, and we remind ourselves of that. And God, I pray that right now you would do your preparation in our life, that you would take uh, what's going on today to prepare us for tomorrow. Lord, help us to, to yield our lives to you, to surrender to you so that you can prepare us for that thing that you have for us, that good work that you've called us to do. Lord, I pray that you would prepare us now. Show us the promises that you have for us. Give us vision for our lives. Give us purpose for tomorrow. Lord, I just pray that you'd speak to us, even today, about the preparation that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm gonna have to move quickly here. Another thing that I believe happens in our waiting is pruning. Sometimes there are things in our life that God needs to work on. Maybe there's some adjustments he wants to make, some dead branches that need to be trimmed out of there, and he prunes us. And you know, so up until this point, David had it easy. He was the golden boy. He, he was the, the great harpist, and he was a brave young man, and he looked good, and he defeated Goliath, and women were singing songs about him. David was amazing. But then Saul became jealous, and Saul became afraid of David. And it says one day, uh, as David was playing the harp for Saul, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it at David, trying to kill him. 
He said, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. And his troubles went downhill from there as Saul uh, basically issued a death warrant for David and commanded that David be put to death. And he tried to get rid of David. And David had to flee for his life in the middle of the night. See, David, he learned in the fields as a shepherd, but now he was going to learn in a season of wilderness and adversity and trials. He had new lessons to learn. And there are some things in our life that we just can't learn in good times, it seems. Some, some things we learn uh, when life is a little bit harder. I'll never forget, in high school, I really liked to play football. And my senior year, uh, we didn't have a very good team. Even though there was a group of us, we loved playing, we tried hard. Uh, the fruit of our senior year of football, varsity football, was that we were 0-9, and, and only three of them were close. It was a painful year of defeat after defeat after defeat. But I tell you what, I think I learned more in that winless season of football than I could have ever learned from a book or from success anywhere. I learned, uh, I learned how to lay down my pride. Uh, I learned about being motivated even without success. We learned about self-worth. We learned about perseverance. There was, there was work that God was doing in my life. And I can look back at that time, and I remember I used to think, Man, I can succeed in everything except sports, it seems like. But, uh, you know, God works in us in our hard times and in our struggles. And, and sometimes we don't succeed. Sometimes uh, we have people who are against us. Sometimes we don't have a good outcome at work. Sometimes life's just hard. But even in adversity, God is working. God is working. And you might think, boy, I need to just get out of this situation, but maybe, just maybe, God's working on something in you in this situation. David dodged spears. He didn't grab them and turn around and throw them back. God worked in him, even while he was a fugitive. The first place he went was a place called Gath, and when he was there, he realized, oh no, these people, they don't like me. I could really be in trouble, and so in order to survive says that David had to pretend to be insane in their presence. And he acted like a madman. He was making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva drip down his beard. He was, he was drooling and acting crazy. You think God was working in him in that situation? I think he was learning some lessons. In fact, uh, one of the Psalms that David writes is Psalm 34. And it says that he wrote this psalm in the season when he pretended to be insane in Gath. In a time of just real trial and adversity, he says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. Do you think those words meant a little something deeper to David? Those who look to him, their faces are never covered in shame the one who had to act like an insane madman, drool coming down his beard. But God showed him, I'm not ashamed of you. In your humility, I will make you radiant. This poor man called and the Lord heard him, saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And I'm just so challenged by the psalm, knowing the context that it was written in a time when he had to pretend to be insane just to survive. And here he's saying, taste and see that God is good. Taste and see. Instead of focusing on his challenge and his adversity, he's turning to the Lord. He's praying. He's responding to the pruning in prayer. He's seeking the Lord. And God's answering him. And some of us, we're in a season of pruning. In our waiting, God says, we need to take that branch out. And he's got those big old garden clippers. And we need to be willing in our season of waiting to allow God, the master gardener, to come 
and to clip some things out of our lives and to prune us so that we can become more fruitful, so that we can be ready for what he has for us for tomorrow. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me that you may bear much fruit. Remain in me. That's the key. In your time of waiting, remain in him. Prayer is our lifeline to him. That's one way we can remain in him is to just remain in prayer, to go to him in constant prayer. Lord, I need you. I need your help in this situation. And it might just be in your season of waiting. He wants to clip some things out. He's preparing us. He's pruning us. The last thing is that he's proving us. Sometimes we just need to go through some testing to reveal what's in our hearts. In fact, there's several occasions in Scripture where it says God tested them to reveal what was in their heart. And here, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but David experienced his own testing where God was revealing what was in his heart to see if he was ready. And uh, here is David is fleeing from Saul in the wilderness and trying to survive. Saul's trying to kill him. David has an opportunity to kill Saul and to take out his enemy. His men are encouraging him to do it. David, do it. This is the moment God's, God's given you this moment to take over your enemy, to be free. David said, I won't lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. I won't lift my hand against him. And David was proved. His heart was proved, and it was revealed what was in his heart, a heart to honor the one who is in leadership over him, his heart to honor the king, his heart to serve. And even though Saul accused him and pursued him and tried to take him out, David said, I won't, I won't take matters into my own hands. And I think that's the temptation we face sometimes in our waiting, is we face a temptation to try to make it happen ourselves. I'll take matters into my own hands. Okay, nothing's happening. I'm going to make this happen. But those who wait on the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will run and not grow weary. They will rise up with strength like an eagle's. So maybe you're in a season of testing where God's testing your heart, your character. He's testing the work that he's done in you. Is he ready? Is she ready? Can I take them? Can I advance them to the next step? Let me pray for those of us who might be in a season of pruning or proving. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you're at work in our lives while we're waiting. And Lord, for those of us who are in a season of pruning, where you're working in our lives, you're cutting out our pride, you're, you're cutting out our self-reliance, you're, you're working in those deep areas in our heart to bring about integrity and honor and your character, the godly character that you have for us. God, we invite you to work in us in our waiting. We give you permission to work in us. Speak to us about where you're working. God, we want to cooperate. And Lord, for those of us who feel like we're in a season of testing, like gold being refined in the fire, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that what you've done in us would rise to the surface. And that we would allow the impurity to be burned away. We would allow uh, just the, the things that are of ourselves, our own self-effort, we would allow that to be burned away so that what you've done and who you've created us to be might be purified and might, might be like pure gold. So Lord, help us in the waiting as we're being tested. Help us to trust you and help us to praise you in that. In Jesus' name. I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. I'm just going to put one last image on the screen to leave you with as we dismiss. That's the image of a seed going into the ground. And the question uh, that we can ask ourselves 
or the perspective we can have is, am I being buried or am I being planted? And that might make all the difference for you in your waiting. See, we can bury all kinds of stuff, and it'll just remain there hidden in the ground. It won't, it'll, it'll decay, it'll break down, it'll, it'll just sit there. But God wants to plant us. We're like seeds, and he, he wants our hearts and our lives to be good soil. And so if we can allow him to plant us, the seed feels all the same things as something else that's just being buried. It's dark, it's cold, it's, you know, whatever, it's dirty. But the seed has hope because it knows that life is going to spring forth. It knows that fruit is going to come. It knows that purpose is there. And I just want to pro- prophesy over each and every one of you that God is planting seeds in your waiting and that there is hope in the waiting and that you should not lose heart, but that you should persevere and stick with it and trust God in the waiting, knowing that he is planting things in you. Do not give up. Do not lose heart. Do not give Don't be hopeless. God is with you in the waiting. He's working. And at just the right time, light is going to burst forth. Amen? If you just stand with me, let's close with one more word of prayer. Over in cafe service as well. Lord, we just thank you that we are planted. We are not buried. We are not worthless. We are not something to be discarded or hidden. But we are like seeds, valuable seeds planted in the earth. And in our waiting, Lord, we know that there's purpose. We know that you're preparing us. We know that you're pruning us. We know that you're uh, working in us because you have purpose and life for us. And so, Lord, we wait with great expectation for life to birth forth out of this situation. Whatever our waiting situation is, We just proclaim that life will burst forth at the right time, and we just claim that and we receive that in Jesus' name. Lord, give us patience in the waiting. Help us to be a part of the process that you want to have in our lives. Lord, we want to trust you and praise you in every situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are six minutes over time. Thank you for being patient with me this morning cafe service. Uh, Turn it over to Ross over there or Jen. And uh, God bless you as we're dismissed. If you're hanging around for growth track, we'll see you at noon over in the Kids Connection. Looking forward to having you there. If you want prayer this morning, come on down. We'd be happy to pray for you. God bless you. We'll see you.